My name is Eric Richman. I'm a clinical social worker here at the Cummings School, and I consult to the Pet Loss Hotline, which we'll talk a little bit about. And uh, I also run a Pet Loss Support Group monthly. Uh, tonight, we're very excited to have our two speakers. Uh, they're going to be talking about loving and losing animals, understanding and supporting those that are grieving. The seminar is part of the Animal Matters uh, seminar series, and it's presented by the Tufts Center for Animals and Public Policy. It's also supported tonight by the T Tufts Pet Loss Hotline. The Center for Animals and Public Policy at Cummings School of Veterinary Medicine promotes research, education, service, and constructive dialogue in its efforts to enhance human-animal relationships and advance the well-being of animals and people. This is part of the Animal Matters series. Uh, the center offers uh, this series for a balanced and informed and respectful discussion of the difficult issues in animal ethics, policy, and practice that face the veterinary profession and society. For those of you who are not familiar, the Pet Loss Hotline here at Cummings School was started about 25 years ago. And it is supported solely by a uh, run, I'm sorry, run and staff solely by students. The consultants are myself, uh, Dr. Emily McCobb, who's here today, and Dr. Alicia Karras, two uh, DVMs who uh, have teach or have taught at our school. Um, let me introduce tonight's speakers. First, we have on my, to the left, <laughs> is uh, Dr. Karen Fine who is a graduate of the Cumming School in 1992. Uh, she goes by she, her, and hers. Uh, she is an integrative veterinarian who writes, who is a writer and who operated her own house call practice for 25 years. Her memoir, The Other Family Doctor, a veterinarian explores what animals can teach us about love, life, and mortality. Uh, is a it will be available in March of this year from Penguin Random House Books. Um, it explores her experience as both a pet owner and a veterinarian. Dr. Fine's textbook, Narrative Medicine and Veterinary Practice, Improving Client Communication, Patient Care, and Veterinary Well-Being, was published in October 2021 with uh, CRC Press. She co-edits Reflections, which is an online journal on veterinary narrative medicine. She's written for Bark Magazine and Inside Your Cat's Mind, and has authored a pet obituary writing guide, which by the way, I uh, recommend all the time to folks who come to my pet loss support group. It's um, in some ways a very cathartic healing way of coping with loss. And uh, her website is Karen Fine, one word, dvm.com. Also tonight we have E.B. Bar Bartels. Did I pronounce your name right? Yeah, right E.B. Bartels. Uh, she is a nonfiction writer, a former Newtonville bookseller, uh, a books bookseller, and a Grub Street instructor with an MFA from Columbia. Her work has appeared in Salon, Slate, WBOR, Literary Hub, Catapult, Electric Literature, The Rampus, and The Millions, among others. She is the author of Good Grief on Loving Pets Here and Hereafter from uh, Mariner Books, HarperCollins Publishing. Uh, it's a narrative fiction, nonfiction book about loving and losing animals. And she also edits the interview series, Nonfiction, about non-humans on the literary site, Fiction Advocate. E.B. lives outside of Boston with her husband, Richie, and their dog, two tortoises, a small flock of pigeons, and a dozen fish or so. Mm -hmm. So we're very excited tonight. Uh, before we start, we uh, did auction off two of uh, EB's books. So we didn't auction them, we uh, lotteried them. So we, beforehand, we uh, very highly scientific method, picked names out of a hat. And the winners tonight of those are Michaela, and I won't pronounce your last name, that's why I told you not to leave. So afterward, you, if you'd like to come up and collect that, we have that for you. And I think the author will sign it for you. And also, I don't think she's here tonight, but Jess Eisenbarth. But I know where she lives, so we can find her. OK, take it away. <clears throat> Excuse me. Well, thank you very much, Eric. We're very happy to be here. Very grateful to you and the Pet Loss Hotline 
and the Center for Animals and Public Policy. And I'm also very grateful to the field of veterinary social work. Very, very glad uh, to have it in existence and to have you here. One more thing I forgot. Sure. Um, sorry. One more thing. I just want a, a big round of applause for Ginny in the front row here, who helped set all this up. Publications, all of this. Thank you, Jenny. Yes, thank you so much, Jenny. Oh, sure, of course. And anyone who knows me will not be surprised. I have a giant chocolate chip cookie right here, just in case. Um, so tonight we're going to cover, I'm just going to um, say what we're going to cover first, and then we'll have time for questions and certainly other topics if they come up. Um, so we're going to talk about why pet loss is so hard the importance of listening to people, especially from the pet loss hotline perspective, and also from this perspective of being a veterinarian with somebody in the room with you. And we're gonna talk about daily routines and how they are interwoven in the lives of our, our animals and, and how that changes when we lose them. We're gonna talk about grieving methods and ideas for that. And finally, we're gonna talk about getting a new pet. So first of all, uh, we're going to start by talking about why pet death is so difficult. And I'm going to turn it over to EB and say, you know, in terms of what, what made you start writing your book? Sure. Thank you, Karen. Um, and thank you, Eric, and everyone for having um, us here. Um, so I, I'm not a veterinarian. I am in, in awe of everyone like you. Um, I'm just someone who's had a lot of pets. And um, when I was in my MFA program um, in nonfiction writing, I was writing um, about my family, and that included both human family members and non-human family members. Um, but when I was writing those, you know, personal essays and stories about my pets, I um, found that they all ended with how those pets died, because that's what happens with pets. Um, maybe parrots and tortoises are the exception, but most pets, um, we outlive our pets. So um, a friend of mine in grad school read some of the stories and, you know, thought, oh, you know, it could be interesting if you sprinkled in a few fun facts about the history of pet grieving uh, rituals and death customs. And I said, sure. Uh, and I started to do some research and very quickly I was overwhelmed by the amazing range of ways that people mourn and remember their pets. Um, and I think, you know, with humans, you often have a set um, group of rituals that varies based on your religion or your um, background or your culture. But, you know, like I was raised, you know, Italian Catholic and outside Boston. So I knew that when a person died, we would have a wake, we would have a funeral and we had like that checklist. But with pets, you know, you could do nothing. You could do the same things that you would do for a person. You can make up totally new things. Um, and so I became really interested in investigating the different ways that people mourn their pets. Um, and in particular, I really wanted to know more about it because pet death was something that um, was really hard and sad for me because I love my animals. And often I felt very alone when they died because I felt, you know, like, am I the only weirdo who's crying this much about my dog or, you know, missing a week of college to go home to be with my parents? Um, and so I found it actually really cathartic in researching this book to learn pretty quickly that obviously that's not true. Anybody who loves animals has a pretty hard time when they, they pass. Um, so in particular, I found in my research and I, you know, of course want Karen's perspective as well is pet death is really challenging for a few reasons. One, um, just because pets don't live as long. So if you have a lot of animals in your life, it happens more frequently, um, and then there's also the fact that, um, pets, you know, are often seen as extensions of ourselves. So, you know, like you're not usually embarrassed if your dog catches you when you come out of the shower, you know, um, you feel kind of like animals are part of yourself. So losing that feels like losing part of yourself. Um, and often we can be physically close to our pets in ways that it's hard to be with other people. You know, like you cuddle with your cat or like your dog sleeps in your bed and there are often very few humans in our lives that we're that comfortable with. Um, and then of course, there's the fact that with pets, we're responsible for their care um, and you spend their whole lives making sure they are happy and healthy. And even though death is inevitable, 
there's a lot of feeling of responsibility. I think when a pet dies, even if it's completely normal, natural. Um, and then because often, uh, you know, pet owner has to make the call about whether or not to euthanize. There's that extra burden, which often people don't have to deal with when other people um, are dying. Um, Karen, what what else have you observed about why pet death so, is so challenging? And first of all, I'd like to say, I know, I know you're not a veterinarian, but your chapter on veterinarians in your book was so fantastic because usually as a veterinarian, you might read someone else's take on it and you might be like, well, you know, they got this right, but they didn't quite, you know, get that right. But you got everything right. Thank you. I mean, it's I interviewed just, like 30 vets for the book. So you did a great job. I was just nodding the whole time going, yes, yes, yes. You know, you really, you really get it. Um, so I feel like a lot of times people are surprised by the intensity of their grief with mm -hmm. animals. And that's something I've been thinking a lot about lately. And I had a, a, a man at the clinic um, about a month or so ago, and he was in with his cat. And he said, he started talking about his dog. And he said, you know, I lost my parents three weeks apart, but losing my dog was harder. And so that's something that I think people come in. And I don't know if it's just that we're some of the only people they can say things like that to, or just coming to the clinic brings up, you know, I was here with the dog. Um, but you know, sometimes people come in with one animal and they, they want to talk about another animal. So I think, you know, everything you just said was, was spot on about why, you know, and especially when you look at the pandemic, you know, people were trapped at home and they had their animals, but they're, they're such a part of the family and just further later on, we're going to talk about daily routines, but I think that's also partly why our animals are so important to us because, mm -hmm. Every single day we get up and we think about them. Are there, you know, do they need to go outside? Do they need to eat? We have to feed them. They're there when we get home. Every single day we're thinking about them. And we have family members that may live far away. We may have a complicated relationship with, and we don't necessarily think about them every single day or not with that same, we're not looking at them every, every single day. So mm -hmm. I think that's part of it. Yeah, I, I interviewed um, several pet owners for the book who talked about feeling way more upset over the death of a pet than a family member. Um, one example is my friend's mom. Um, her father passed away, so my friend's grandfather and the mom and the grandfather were, were basically estranged. They always had a very turbulent relationship. And, you know, he died and she was entitled to bereavement leave and she was sort of indifferent, I guess. So maybe that sounds cold to say, but she had kind of mourned him a long time ago. Um, and then I think it was like six months later, her cat died. And my friend said her mom like lost it because she was, this cat was who she spent the most time with. She saw all the time. And then of course, you know, she didn't get bereavement leave for her cat's death, but that was the death she really needed it um, for. Um and I think too, just like pets love us in such an unconditional way that when a person dies, it can be so complicated. You know, you can feel sad and also relieved and angry and all those different things. But most of the people I talked to when pets died just felt really sad. And that was a pretty pure feeling. It is. It's it's really incredible. It, it just made me think too, while you were talking that, you know, because her father died, it's almost like maybe sometimes we have those relationships we didn't have with our family that maybe we thought we would or we wanted to, we might have those with our pets. Yeah. Um, and that's something I think a lot of people that I know have, have experienced. Yeah. The other thing too, um, that Karen and I have spoken about a lot before is the idea of pet death being a type of, um, disenfranchised grief. So that's a term that I heard a lot in research that I was reading, that's often used to talk about a type of grief that's not as socially acceptable to speak about or or even you're completely prohibited from bringing up. Um, so people often use it to talk about, you know, abortion or miscarriage or divorce, like other types of grieving that maybe are not, you know, as traditional as like losing a parent, um, for example. And pet death, I think, we can talk more about this. I think things are changing and people are being much more open and sharing, um, with pet death. But for a long time, I think people really bottle up those feelings. I even did it. And, you know, there were a few friends who I knew were also like, you know, crazy pet people too, who I could talk to about those feelings, but often, you know, 
Um, I remember feeling almost embarrassed actually when I was in college and was asking to miss class so I could go home to be with my parents when we put down our dog and not really sure what the reaction I was going to get. You know, was a professor going to think this was inappropriate that I was asking? Were they going to not really care, but be okay with it? And the best reaction I got is one of my professors, he started crying and telling me about his dog. And he was, he became my major advisor actually, because he was the best. Um, but I think that's also why pet death is so hard because there aren't as many channels where maybe you know you can talk about it safely. I think in general, too, in our culture, there's this expectation that you're going to move on quickly with grief in general, that, you know, everything is, well, that was so five minutes ago. So, you know, you can be sad for a few days or maybe a week about your animal, but if you're still grieving or still trying to sort things out, that's less accepted. Mm -hmm. um, and then people will be like, you know, are you still, you're still that upset about your, your cat? Um, and of course, as veterinarians, we don't really get that as much because people, you know, we tend to be surrounded by people that are animal lovers themselves. And even if they're not, they're like, oh, well, she's nutty anyways, because she's a veterinarian. So we tend to not have the experience. And I think about that sometimes when I send a card, I think this might be the only card this person receives. Mm. So I kind of feel that, you know, I really want to say something with that particular person you know, what I imagine they would want or need to hear may, may only come from me. So I kind of, I kind of feel that as a, as a pressure sometimes, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Actually, when I was researching my book, um, I often was texting my parents to ask them to confirm details about pets I'd had. And my mom at one point was like, Oh, do you want this stuff? Would this be helpful? And pulled out this box that was just full of sympathy cards she had gotten when our dogs died and she kept them and it included the cards from the vets and like clearly they were important enough that, you know, she kept them for Gusta in 2006 and she, you know, still had them all. So those cards really make a big impact. Um, and another way of, you know, finding people um, who you can feel comfortable speaking with is I have found social media is a really nice tool for that. So a lot of my friends, when they've lost an animal, will go through and post, you know, an Instagram, like 10 photo story or a Facebook album and write like, um, you know, an obituary or a post about their animal. And if people think, okay, EB is really overreacting, they can just kind of scroll past it. Um, I mean, there's some people who love to engage with things that they don't have nice things to say about, but most people hopefully just scroll past it, but then people who want to engage and who understand, um, can choose to post and, and comment. And, you know, um, my friend Annie, actually her dog Harvey, when he was dying, she was really posting all these updates about his cancer and his whole journey on Facebook. And when he finally died, she ended up getting like 40 sympathy cards because so many people have been following along. Um, so I think that's a really wonderful way to kind of find your people who you can talk to. That's wonderful. Yeah. Wow. Uh, I keep all my sympathy cards too, but I didn't know if that's because I'm just a veterinarian. So. Um, but yeah, I would imagine a lot of people do. And some animal, I mean, animal, we have different relationships with different animals too. So there may be an animal that dies that you're able to move on more easily from. And then there's another animal that maybe it's that time in your life or it's that particular animal, that relationship that you have a really difficult time. Mm -hmm. um, and then- you know, one thing I was going to say was um, in terms of the pet loss support hotline is the importance of just listening because somebody may not have anybody else to talk to. And I'm interested to hear because you did all those interviews. Yeah. If that was your experience. I found so many people just immediately wanted to open up and tell me about their, their pet death stories. And often frequently said, I've never talked to anyone else about this before. Um, I tried really hard in my book. I didn't want to pressure anyone into talking to me for it, um, unless they wanted to. So I would kind of post things. I actually use Facebook and Twitter a lot to kind of say, you know, I'm writing this book and I would love to talk to people who have, um, pet memorial tattoos. So if you have a tattoo that you got in honor of a pet that's passed, let me know if you'd like to talk. And so people reached out to me. So they kind of self-selected if they were comfortable talking. Um, though I also found too, and we've talked a bit about sort of the importance of self-disclosure that people were even quick, quicker, 
super faster. So open up to me when I shared my own pet death stories. Cause they were like, Oh, she's not just some journalist who's going to make fun of me and write like a scathing tell all thing, making fun of me. You know, I was sharing how, you know, devastated I was when my you know dogs died and people then wanted to share in return. So, um, yeah, but I was, I was really sad actually when so many people told me that they had never spoken to anyone else about that before. Um, and some of it's generational, like my grandfather, who um, he's going to be 89 next week. And he he was really devastated when his dog died. But, you know, he's a man of a certain generation and you stuff those feelings down and you move on. And after Samantha died, he gathered up all her things, threw them out in a dumpster and didn't speak about her basically until I was born and started asking a lot of nosy questions. <laughs> so, wow. yeah. Yeah, I, I do think talking about it or just feeling like there's a community of other people. And I think social media is really good for that, mm -hmm. that you can recognize that you're not alone, um, that there are other people grieving. There's even a Monday night pet loss, um, like candle lighting ceremony online that I think is an international thing, which is which is really wonderful. Um, and then, yeah, back to the to the listening, I have this memory and I, I wrote about it in my, my textbook that about listening, that it was during the height of the pandemic and we were seeing appointments at curbside and the clinic I was at had windows in, the, in two of the exam rooms. And so what we did was the owner of the clinic set up like a, a barrier six feet away with a rope and some chairs. Um, so if it was nice out, you know, people would be sitting, there was even like a plant or something like that, you know, we tried to make it nice, but this happened to be at night and it was dark and it was cold. And I was doing just a, a wellness check. We were at the point where we were seeing wellness exams again, and I was doing a wellness check on this, uh, older woman's cat and I was finishing up her cat was healthy. So I was, I had a little stool by the by the window and I had little like gloves that went up to here so I could try to write stuff down. And um, I said, you yeah, know, your kitty's all set and the, the text bringing her out to you. Um, and she said, I really miss my old cat. And I just kind of settled back down in the, in the chair because I felt like she really needed to talk to me. And she just started saying that um, her old cat had been there when her husband died and that um, that cat knew he was sick and would cuddle up with him. And I just tried to kind of listen to her story. And, and the other, you know, the thing is sometimes people tell us these stories and usually we're trying to fix things, but for something like this, we're just listening and just me saying, oh, wow, that, that kitty sounds so special. And mm -hmm. I'm so sorry for your loss. And of course you still think of that cat, you know, even though you love this new one, um, it was just very moving to me because I couldn't even touch her. I couldn't come within six feet of her, but I tried to kind of receive her story. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that's a really wonderful thing we can we can do for people, whether it's on the pet loss hotline or someone who comes into the clinic or someone you're just talking to on the phone. Um, you know, people people do those those kinds of of things often. Yeah. And, um, something else too, is I, you know, people, I think really want to find more spaces to, to share these stories. And, um, it's funny when I was trying to sell the book to find a publisher for the book, um, over and over the feedback I got from editors was if people love animals, why would they want to read about animals dying? And, you know, I think that's a legit question. I definitely have some people who told me like, I bought your book to support you, but I'm never going to read it. And I'm like, that's okay. Like, you know, there's some people who like, you can't watch a movie where a dog dies. Like there's a um, old great website called does the dog die.com, which I actually recommend to people if they're um, dealing with like pet loss and it would be, you know, triggering to see something, but you can look it up and it will tell you like, okay, a dog dies, but not a cat or like a horse. Anyway, that's a tangent, but but these editors kept saying like, this is too depressing. And meanwhile, while I was getting all this feedback from these publishers, I was mentioning to family and friends and neighbors. And I was kind of just like talking about what I was writing about to anyone who would listen. 
And people were amazingly like super excited about it. And they just wanted to tell me their stories. They were asking questions about other rituals. They were like, oh, is this a new thing? And I'd be like, no, let me tell you about this dog that was found in the Czech Republic that was like, you know, 3000 years old or whatever. And um, people were really excited to talk about some of these really hard things. And pretty consistently, people would say, I've never talked to anyone about this before. And then afterwards, even if they cried, they would say, I'm really glad that we talked about this. Um, Cause I often felt bad that I was like torturing people for my research to relive some of the saddest memories, but people wanted to talk about it. I think the memories and talking about them sort of keeps, keeps the animal alive, keeps that relationship alive. So I think it's good. And I, I wrote my memoir first and then the textbook sort of came accidentally afterwards and it was during COVID. But when I wrote my memoir, it was, um, I really felt like I was writing to a need. Like I was going, especially doing house calls and doing acupuncture. I did a lot of sort of hospice-y. I wasn't, I didn't officially call it hospice or anything, but that type of work where I would see animals regularly and talk to the people and sort of you know, kind of be informally counseling them. Um, but uh, um, sorry, I just lost my train of thought. Um, so I felt like there was this need. I felt that um, things I was saying to people and people felt guilty and people were really, really upset and had nowhere to go. And I, I think I just wanted people to know mainly that they weren't alone. Um, and E.B. mentioned, I won't go into it in depth, but the topic of self-disclosure, um, that's actually been studied in human medicine, but not in veterinary medicine. And self-disclosure can be um, as simple as, you know, this is how I give my dog medications, like a pediatrician would say, this is how I give my child medications. Or it can be, you know, there was, there was one um, client I had and he was telling me, you know, he wanted me to euthanize his dog, but he was also angsting because the dog was still eating. And he said, I just don't know if this is the right thing. So I told him about one of my animals, my dog, who was still eating, and I made the decision. And his mother, who was sort of really my client, later told me that, you know, yeah, that really helped him. Um, so I think what E.B. was saying about opening up, um, I think it's something human medicine, they're sort of really cautioned not to do it. But I think veterinary medicine, it's very different because we're we're in the caretaker role and we're talking to people who are also in the caretaker role. So it's different than hearing your doctor say, well, this is how I prepared for my colonoscopy. You might be like, I don't want to know that. But hearing like, oh, you know, I had an animal with diabetes too, and this is how I dealt with it. And I was also in denial at first, and I had a hard time giving injections. And, you know, boy, people might be, you know, really interested in hearing that. Mm -hmm. So I think self-disclosure um, can be very valuable. Even just saying, you know, yeah, I, I, I understand because when my animals, it's like when people, when you're doing euthanasia and people start crying and they apologize and I'm like, yeah, when it's my animal, I'm really upset too. Of course you're upset. Don't mm -hmm. apologize for, for being upset. Yeah. I mean, I think in general, um, Americans are very weird about talking about death um, of all kinds. And something else that I um, learned in my research, which I have found really helpful to keep in mind, sort of similar to, you know, the idea of like, you never really know what someone's going through, right? Like if someone's like crabby to you in the grocery store, like you don't know, they might've just gotten a cancer diagnosis that morning. Um, but I learned that you know, grief really, it just like builds on itself and it doesn't matter what triggers the grief, but that it all sort of is wrapped up together. And so, you know, someone could be mourning the death of their cat, but it's also reminding them of the death of their mom, which is also reminding them of the death of the dog they had before that and the death of like their grandfather when they were a kid. And it's all just sort of a mesh together. So I think like when somebody brings up something and tentatively is like, I really miss my cat. You don't really know like everything that they're saying under there. They might not know either, but I think that's why it's important to give space for listening and sharing. Yeah, I I agree. And it just makes me think of a, a dog I saw last week. It was at uh, sort of one year checkup and I had seen the dog as a puppy and I had written in my notes from the previous year that the, the client told me that a month after she got the dog, her daughter died. 
Um, so it, I also knew this dog was really special to her because of that. Um, and the dog also um, had been abused. It was a rescue and it literally had a kind of a deformed mouth, which was consistent with blunt trauma injury. Mm -hmm. And the history was that they think the puppy was on a beach somewhere and it got kicked in the, in the face. Um, and the, you know, the mouth was sort of consistent with that. So we don't know for sure, but I, I felt really like she had this special relationship with this animal and even more so because the animal came into her life as she lost her daughter. Um, and then sometimes too, we'll have people that have the pets of a deceased family member. Mm -hmm. um, and so then when, when that animal gets sick, it's not just, you know, that animal, it represents their mother or their brother or whoever. I mean, I think I've seen, you know, their, their children, I've seen that, you know, the boyfriend, whatever. Um, and I always try to make a note in the record so that anybody looking at that will know that, you know, okay, this was her deceased brother's cat. Um, because you may want to take that into consideration. There's like a whole nother level of, you know, of things yeah. to go with that. Or even just, I talked to a lot of parents who kind of joked that they got suckered into having pets by their kids and then their kids go off to college. And when those pets die, a lot of parents I spoke to said they felt really a loss because it felt like the end of an era even, right? That their kids were now adults and living out of the house and the pet was gone and you know, that is another type of loss as well. Absolutely. I think that's a good segue into the routines. Yeah. Um, do you want to start? Um, sure. Yeah. So I, I feel like um, that's what I've been thinking about lately is how important these routines are and that we see our animals first thing in the morning and last thing at night. And I had a client write an obituary, which I put in my textbook with her permission, of course. And um, it just, it's a kitty. And it was just so moving how she said, you know, when I pull into the driveway every day, you're either in the window or when I open the door, I hear the thump and you've jumped off the bed where you've been sleeping. Um, and then when I'm walking around in the yard, you're in the window. And, you know, this is what you, you know, I love how you rub against me and that you do this at night. You know, this is where you sleep. And she just sort of went on and on about all these, you know, kind of daily things with the cat and how important it is. Um, and I, I didn't bring the book, but there's a, a really good book called um, the, I'm gonna forget, it's the octopus, Lily and the octopus. Um, so it's about a, a gay man who had sort of a bad last relationship and he's living alone with his dog, Lily, and she gets a tumor on her head. And he's so like his whole life is this dog to the point where he talks to her as though she's human and he can't even think of it as a tumor. So he calls it the octopus. And it's, it's, it's a very good book. And then when he finally does lose her, he gets home and he's looking around his apartment and he's going you know, here's the cupboard where the treats are that she would go to. And here's where her food bowl would be. And here's the, you know, here's the mixer where I would use every year to make her birthday cake. And here's the patch of sun she would lie in in the afternoon. And it just, you know, he kind of went on and on. And that, that's a novel, it's fiction, but it was still so moving to me that, you know, just looking around, everything was what the dog does every day and what he and the dog shared every day. So I just feel like that's um, really important. And um, I think especially when animals are in sort of a hospice type situation and people are taking care of them and they're up in the night with them and they may not even realize how difficult it is that they're, what they're doing. And I, like, I had one client say to me, she was taking care of her lab who had osteosarcoma. And she said, I try to shower when she's sleeping. And I was, I just thought, oh, you, you know, like, and she had told me to that client that she had nursed both of her parents through hospice. And she kind of said, well, now I'm, I'm doing it for, for her, for the dog. So I'm, we had talked about this before, but um, I think EB has some thoughts on how, what to do after the animal's gone about those routines. Yeah. I mean, um, I think one of the most beautiful essays I've read that um, it's about a lot of different things, but talks about sort of those routines with animal and hospice is the fourth state of matter by Joanne Beard. And, um, it's just about her, like her a collie has in, is incontinent and keeps peeing. And so it's just her doing the laundry over and over and over again. Um, 
But yeah, over and over people said to me when I interviewed them that the thing that always hit them was how quiet like it was to come home. And I like, I know that feeling and I definitely know that's why a lot of people love to get, you know, a bridge pet. So then it's not quite as quiet, but I don't think that really gets rid of the the loss. Um, but I, I heard some really helpful advice for different ways to preserve routines. Um, so, cause I think part of what's so unmooring about death is suddenly like your whole you know, routine and life is upended. Um, so two things I heard was one, you know, paying attention to the things you're doing, especially maybe if you've been caretaking for an animal intensely. One vet I interviewed talked about a client of hers who had two cats. One was very sick um, and had to have medicine that was like on a very strict schedule. So um, this woman had to get up in the middle of the night to give the older cat medicine. And the younger cat though, then obviously also woke up too. And so it became this thing that's like two in the morning, we all get up, everyone gets a treat and then we go back to bed. And um, the vet actually advised, she's like, you know, for the first few weeks, I would say, keep your alarm, still get up in the middle of the night, give your healthy cat a treat and then both go back to bed just because that's what you've both been used to for, you know, six months, a year, however long she'd been doing it. So those little things, so it's not, you know, an abrupt change for everyone's routine. Um, and an example that actually just happened in my neighborhood, um, two of my neighbors, they're friends. Um, they've been friends for a really long time. And between them, they have three dogs. And every morning, the two neighbors, they meet up and they walk their three dogs together to the park and they walk around the park and they come back. And, um, one woman, the, one woman has two dogs and the other has one, her dog, um, passed away. And I noticed that every morning I would still see both neighbors met up and would walk with the two dogs that were left to the park and come back. Um, even though one neighbor, she didn't have her dog anymore. She still was part of that routine. Um, and I think that that can be really nice. You know, um, didn't, do you said you have an aunt who, kept going to the dog park was yeah that, or? my aunt lives in Australia and she had two cavaliers and first one died and then the other and then I remember her saying they would still go to their dog park sort of meetup group um even though they didn't have a dog that they they valued those friendships and they got to watch all the dogs run around and play and have a wonderful time mm -hmm. and they did now um recently get a puppy but for several months they were they were dogless so they they did that yeah so I think those those things can be really nice or even just going for walks. Like I had a friend who talked about when his dog died, he suddenly realized he hadn't like left the house in days because he was so used to going out and walking the dog and he works from home. So then he was like, oh my gosh, I need to go get some, you know, fresh air. So just even setting those timers and thinking, okay, you know, my dog is gone, but I can still go for a walk. So. Yeah, that's actually a good segue into, um, talking about getting another pet, mm -hmm. although we, um, we can come back to grieving methods, yeah. but my, um, my friend's father, the dog was killed suddenly while he was walking the dog. I think it was, um, it was in the middle of winter, there were snow banks everywhere and he was walking and it was a little dog who I think ran out into the road from a snow bank and someone was speeding and the, the, yeah, right in front of him, it just sounded horrific, but he literally went the next day to the shelter and came back with an adult dog. Um, and he just, I remember him saying, I need a dog. Otherwise I'll never get out of the house. You know, walking the dog was just a huge part of his, his life and his health and his routine living, living alone. He has a couple cats, but, um, yeah, I just feel like there's no right or wrong. You know, I don't try to counsel people like there's, it's just whatever you want to do. Yeah. I, it's, I'm sure you all have experienced this, but like people ask me all the time, well, one, when do you know when it's time to euthanize? And there's no one answer. Right. And similarly, I think there's no one answer for when to get a new pet. I, um, you know, I, my parents waited five years between our dog Gwen and they have a dog honey. Now, um, my husband took almost a decade before he felt ready to get another dog. Um, and then other people similarly, like a week later, they're down at the shelter and they found a new, a new dog. And sometimes it works for people, but also I think sometimes people do rush getting a new pet, um, because it's easier to have a new pet to worry about than to sit with the really hard feelings of missing your old pet. Um, and my friend Annie, actually the one who um, got all the sympathy cards, 
she, you know, and I talked about she got a new dog pretty soon after uh, Harvey died. And she said for a while, she sort of resented him a little bit because she was like, oh, well, Harvey would never have done that. You know, Harvey was perfect. And, you know, poor Willie is just trying to be a dog. <laughs> and I think that it's important to, you know, and they're fine now, but like, I think that it's important to really listen to yourself and what you think you need. Um, and I often recommend to people, um, if you aren't sure there are ways that you can experience like being around animals without having to commit. So, um, like a lot of vets I spoke to recommend often like volunteering at a shelter. So you could go and, you know, help pet the cats and clean and, you know, wash dogs, walk dogs, whatever. And that's a nice way to feel, you know, connected to animals, even if you're not quite sure you're ready to, you know, bring a new animal home. Um, you can also, I did a lot of dog sitting actually for friends right after my dog Gwen died. Um, and, you know, even just like, yeah, if you used to go to the dog park or go for walks, you know, and hang out with your friends, pets, I think that can be helpful as you're feeling out where you are in the process. Yeah, definitely. I, I, I do encourage people to try to get, um, you know, some people are just like German shepherds are their breed and they're only going to get a German shepherd. But for me, I try to get an animal that looks different. Mm. Um, or maybe if you had a male, get a female or something like that. If you're, you know, if you've got to have a breed that always looks similar, like yellow labs or something. Um, and also not to call the same name, although some people just occasionally run into people that are like, um, so I've visited a lot of pet cemeteries and I've seen like family plots where it's like Charlie one, Charlie two, Charlie three. And like, they have little photos and they're like all cocker <laughs> spaniels. And you're like, oh my gosh, wow. Um, yeah, no, I, I, I think that finding a different looking animal can really help. Um, yeah, my husband grew up with a chocolate lab and he basically was like, I can never have another chocolate lab. Um, but, uh, yeah, some people it's like their breed and, you know, but even within a breed, it's, they're different animals, right? They're different animals yeah. and you've, you've got to expect that. And I think it's a little easier to realize that when the animal looks different, mm -hmm. whereas if they don't look different or they don't look that different, you might expect the same behaviors um, and you're not going to get them. I remember I was at a behavior talk some years ago um, and I forget what behaviorist it was, but she said that she says that the people will say to her, well, I always have German shepherds. I've had seven of them or whatever. And she'll say, well, huh, you know, do you have siblings? And they'll say, yeah. And, the, and she'll say, you know, are you like your siblings? <laughs> and they'll say, no, we're nothing alike. So I thought that was a very good example of mm -hmm. how, you know, just because they're the same breed doesn't mean they're going to have the same personality. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other thing I just wanted to um, quickly say about um, the question you got about and how do you know when it's time? Um, I, I, you know, especially, you know, vet students, um, I often say to people that there, for many situations, there's a spectrum of time. And I know we're not going to go into that topic today. So I just wanted to sort of throw that out there that I'll often say, you know, in many cases, there's a spectrum of time where it's euthanasia is an acceptable decision, acceptable choice. Um, and I think sometimes that makes people feel better. Like, you know, you might make a decision here, someone else might make a decision there, but you've got this spectrum. And I, I, I think that's usually true. It's certainly not always true. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I don't know if you want to take a few questions. Sure. Yeah, let's do that if we have a lot of questions. Well, yeah, so there's a few. We'll, we'll start with the online folks since they didn't get the delicious food that Elvis <laughs> catered for us. Um, there was an interesting comment from a pediatric nurse practitioner who, as part of her regular visits with families, asked about their pets. And she finds that really helpful because it's a sort of an avenue for the child to talk about their sadness mm -hmm. as well as the adult. I thought that was really interesting and rings true for my career. When I worked in human medicine, I worked on a transplant team. One of the questions I always asked in part of my psychosocial assessment was, do they have pets? What's their relationship like? Because if you ever want to get somebody talking, ask them about their pet, mm -hmm. right? If you have social anxiety, ask them about their pet it'll get people going. Mm -hmm. And um, so I found that very helpful. That's great. Um, there was another question, that was more of a comment that I found very interesting. It's a question about um, bereavement leave. Do you ever think that bereavement leave, she, this woman um, or person, I don't know, said that they work for themselves, so they don't know if it exists, but they don't think it does. And um, I'm not sure if there are companies that have that, but I don't know of them. 
Um, but the question is, do you think there will be bereavement leave or ever be bereavement leave for pets? Well, I'm actually writing an op-ed about this right now because I feel very strongly about it. Um, but most places don't have bereavement leave for pets as of right now. There are a few companies that do. Um, and it's it's interesting because some are like uh, like Trupanion that does pet insurance, does bereavement leave for pets, which makes sense. Um, though I found out that Chewy does not, which is, I think they're working on it. But um, sorry, I don't mean to be like calling businesses out. <laughs> But um, it, it's tricky, though, because, I mean, I think bereavement leave in general, often um, companies just don't give enough of it. Um, and I think also it's really difficult to explain. Um, often a relationship on paper looks very different than what it is in practice, right? You know, like the story I told before, you know, your father could die, but you could have not spoken to your father in 20 years, but you would still be entitled to bereavement leave. But you could have like your first cousin could die and that cousin could have been like your best friend or like a sibling and your company might say, well, cousins don't really count or you get one day as opposed to three. And with pets, you know, I think that I think companies, it would really benefit them if they just let their employees you know, request the time that they need, regardless of what the loss is um, on paper. And so, yeah, there are a few companies that are starting to do it. I like to think that um, maybe more will or make it more general so you don't have to disclose what the death is, but just that you need time. Um, but... Do you know where your op-ed's going to be? Uh, no, not yet. I'm still working on placing it. <laughs> okay. well, this, that could be a good topic for the animals and public policy people, right? Yeah. Um, another question came up. Um, what are your thoughts about grief that manifests as anger or particularly guilt? Yeah. Um, guilt, I feel like there's sort of an epidemic of guilt. Um, and I'm actually, I actually just wrote a, a article about that sort of an op-ed thing that I just sent to my publicist that she's going to try to place before my memoir comes out. But I think, um, and I know Eric and I, we've talked about guilt and that, you know, you said it can be helpful at first. And I think I, I think if it goes on a long time, I feel like I've seen people that their narrative is I failed my animal. And that just breaks my heart because it tends to be the people who really didn't. <laughs> the people who, you know, I mean, the people who you think, oh, you know, maybe they could have done something sooner, not that they didn't love their animal, but um, those tend to not be the people. It's the people that agonized over everything and, you know, pretty much, you know, did, did their best, um, that that's their narrative. And um, that's really heartbreaking to me. So um, you said guilt and what was the other? Anger. And anger. Yeah, I, I wrote about that a little bit in my memoir because my I, I write about I, sort of self-disclosure. Um, I feel like, you know, when I'm practicing, I'll, I'll say, you know, this, this is what happened to me. Instead of saying, I think you should do this. Um, I kind of like to, you know, not that you can do this about everything, but this is what I did in a similar situation, or this is what someone I know did in a similar situation. And I feel like that's a good way to, to give people options or ideas. Um, so I talk about my own dog who had cancer. Um, she had a really bad cancer when she was only four and she lived to be five. Um, but I had another client around the same time whose um, dog had heart disease very young. So we both had the situation of very sick animals that were very young, which was very tragic. But she was, um, he was very mad at the breeder. And I, I thought, you know, what would it be like if I was angry? I didn't really deal with anger because I think as a medical professional, I knew there was no, there was no one to blame. She got cancer. It wasn't, there wasn't anyone I, you know, sort of could rationally blame. But um, I think, you know, maybe especially people in that situation, it would be great if they talked to a veterinary social worker. Um, and I don't know if you have anything to add about the anger. Um, yeah, I think anger and guilt, uh, it's somewhat similar. It, it allows a person who feels that they're helpless and has no control 
to gain some control mm. because it's better to feel anger or guilt than to feel helpless is, is my experience. Mm. Um, and really um, most of the reasons why our animals die are out of our control. And so you feel helpless and you feel a loss of control. And so holding on to some anger and guilt sometimes at least gives you that, some control. That, yeah. That's my working philosophy. No, I mean- Whether it's right or wrong, I don't- Oh, I, I agree completely. And I mean, I'm sure you've all experienced this too, but I think veterinarians are often the target of a lot of anger. Um, and you know, this happens with human doctors as well. Uh, you just want someone to blame. And like, I remember when my aunt died of cancer, you know, uh, my grandparents were, you know, oh, the doctor should have done this surgery or that surgery. And it's just, you're looking for, you know, yeah, it's easier to be angry than to feel helpless. Um, but in terms of- I would also yeah. say um, not only helpless, but for many people, anger is the bodyguard for sadness. So we're taught not to cry, not to sad, be sad a lot of times. A lot of parts of our culture and so um the anger protects us from feeling the deep deep sadness and loss so i call it the body grief. Yeah. i do have one story i could tell about that if, if Take it we away. have Love time stories. so <laughs> yes exactly um and this was um i saw on the schedule i was working at the clinic that um somebody was coming in and i think these this couple, their cat had died, their young cat had died, and they were coming in and they wanted to talk to the veterinarian who'd been taking care of this cat. Um, and she was busy with appointments. So they said, come back. And it was like her, her lunch break, it was from like, I don't know, two to three or something and, or three to four. And I was done with appointments. And I was sort of feeling like she's younger than me. And I'm like, she's so nice. What did, you know, she doesn't deserve to get harassed for her lunch break. So I said, you know what, let me talk to them. You know, I've, you know, dealt with many situations like this. And so it's this couple and, you know, they were, he, the, the guy was sort of posturing a little bit. He was like, well, why even go to veterinarians if they're going to give you medicine that, you know, they felt that this one medicine, that the cat had really bad heart disease. This one medicine had kind of led to the cat's demise. Um, and the cat had died here, I think at Tufts. We cat hadn't died, you know, at the clinic. Um, and so I sort of went through the ultrasound, the echocardiogram report with them and said, you know, okay, well, let's see what, what happened. And this is what the specialist recommended was this medication. And I was going over the report and the, the echo, the cardiologist was, was unsure exactly the extent of the heart disease. So, you know, sort of going it through with them. And when the, the, the husband or boyfriend said that about why even go to the vet, I said, you know, if this, you know, if we can't have a conversation, you know, with a sort of some trust in there, I'm like that. And, and then he sort of was like, oh, no, 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 no. Um, and she was just very sad. I think he was more angry. But as we're going through and that he had recommended the medication, I said, I said, I would have done the same thing if it was my cat. So it's sort of like a self-disclosure. I would have given that medicine if it was my cat. And the whole dynamic in the room changed and she just started sobbing and said, I was so afraid that I had given him the medication that had caused his death and I was feeling so guilty and so bad about it. Um, and the rest of the time was just, you know, sort of me backing that up and saying, of course you did what the specialist recommended and that's what I would have done too. And it, you know, I think the cat had diarrhea and that, you know, I'm not sure if that's why they came here and that's what led to it, but absolutely I, I, I would have, it was true, but I, it, the, the way that helped those people was so amazing to me. And I think the guilt that people feel that they think they participated somehow in something that went wrong. So that was just, um, and then the man could not stop apologizing for one thing. And I was talking to these people for like 45 minutes. So I opened the door and it was almost like all the reception staff were like, mm -hmm. <laughs> They said, we didn't know whether to go in and get you. <laughs> then we heard laughter. So we figured it was okay. And then they all gave me a round of applause after the people left. And I was like, okay. <laughs> you know, but I just thought that was an interesting story about how people can hold on to that and how we sometimes have this, I don't want to say power. We have an ability to, you know, help people let go of some of that guilt, mm -hmm. I think, by saying I would have done the same thing. Yeah. One of the nicest things that um, I heard that I've said to many friends now, actually, when they have a, an aging, dying animal um, is 
I talked to a, a UU minister in Brookline who runs a pet loss circle. And she said that everyone always thinks it was either too soon or too late. And um, I told my friend Greg this when he and his wife were deciding whether or not it was time to euthanize their dog. And he said that really helped them because he was like, you're going to feel like garbage either way. <laughs> so you're either going to think it was too soon or too late. Um, and I think that's just part of the nature of when you are fully in control of this animal's well-being and they can't tell you in words like, hey, I have a weird side effect. I don't feel good. You know, you have to just figure it out. And the other thing I found really helpful, which I'm sure you all know already, is, you know, animals evolve to hide illness and pain. And so people often talk to me, you know, and we're beating themselves up. Like I should have noticed sooner that my animal was sick. And so many vets I spoke to said, no, your animal was doing what they were like designed to do. And if you noticed, it usually means it's like end stage. So those were helpful things I found to kind of, um, diffuse guilt. I think. Absolutely. That's really good. Do we have any questions from the audience here or in-person audience? Any comments? We still can talk about um, way different ways to grieve. Yeah, we had absolutely. one more. Yeah, I think. But if anyone has any questions, absolutely. I also um, I I love to bring these index cards to events, and if you have a a pet story you'd like to share, a pet that's passed, feel free to write write it down. Um, and I have an Instagram account for the book that I think of as like a virtual pet cemetery where it's people have been sharing photos and stories. So if you'd like to be part of that, you're welcome to, to share. Um, but I think uh, Karen and I just had a list of some ideas that you could always recommend to people who are grieving. Um, so obviously I, we talked about social media already and just like the pet loss hotline and finding other people to listen. Um, Obituary writing, which Eric already talked about. Did you want to add a little bit more about obituary sure. writing? So I, I wrote sort of this guide and I had it on my website. Um, and my friend and boss said, I really want you to make that into a pamphlet so I can hand it out to people. Um, so I made it into a pamphlet um, and just talked about, um, you know, that there's no right or wrong time. Um, there's no right or wrong way, giving ideas. But I also think um, a couple of things. One is it's a positive thing you can do. Like Evie, when you were saying your grandfather just kind of gathered up all the things and, you know, like that, mm -hmm. that's a very sad thing when you're saying, oh my goodness, I'm never going to, you know, it, there's some things you can't look at again. And there's some things you want to keep right with you in bed or whatever. But, you know, when you're getting rid of those things you don't want to look at, that's hard. Um, so writing an obituary can be a way to take some of those positive memories and write them down. Um, and I have a list of ideas that I think also you could use on the hotline. Mm -hmm. um, just sort of if somebody, you know, if you don't know how to start, um, you know, like uh, when did you first meet your pet? What kind of trouble did they get into when they were younger, when you first got them or whatever? What nicknames did they have? I mean, just about every animal I know has a million nicknames. Um, what were their favorite food? What were their favorite games? You know, what, what, what were your favorite routines? What did you, you know, things to make you kind of smile and remember and, and to even maybe have family discussions about. So it doesn't have to be even writing something down, although I think that's really helpful. It can be just, you know, let's have a family meeting and each talk about our favorite thing, you know, it's the thing we're going to miss, but, but, you know, what was your favorite memory? What was the favorite memory? What was your favorite nickname? What was your favorite, you know, thing they did to get in trouble or, or something like that. Um, so I, I have these and I have enough for people to take one. So, you know, feel free to come up and, and take one. And it's also on my website. So if you ever have someone who's lost an animal, you can just send them to my website. Um, which is karenfindvm.com. Um, similar to that, I also often recommend to people putting together like a photo album or a scrapbook can be a really nice thing. Um, my friend um, Sean lost his dog um, over the summer. And what was that time? It's confusing. Um, but, you know, he told me that it felt really nice to pick out like the 10 photos he posted on Instagram and kind of go through and see all these memories and choose his favorites. So 
that can be a really nice thing to do. Um, and then in my book, I actually go into a lot of detail about some of the more unusual things that people do as well. Um, there is a chapter where I talk about people who have their pets taxidermied. Um, I interviewed a gentleman who had his dog cloned. Um, there's also people who will do modern mummification. There's also so many different artists who will commission portraits or, um, there are these beautiful glass, um, beads where people can mix in ashes or fur. So you can kind of feel like you have part of your pet, like in this piece of jewelry, you can wear close to your heart. Um, and also, you know, people have tons of rituals, like funerals. I interviewed a couple who had a Yorkie and, the wife um, is Jewish. And so they sat Shiva for the Yorkie and invited people over and kind of did exactly what they would do with a person, but it was with their Yorkie. And I thought that was really sweet. So, um, you know, my, my main takeaway from the book for me is that there's no right or wrong way to grieve. And as long as you're not hurting yourself or anyone else, you know, do whatever makes you feel better. Um, so, you know, if you talk to somebody on the pet loss hotline who maybe is having trouble thinking of, of ways that feel right to memorialize their pet, you know, um, I have a million ideas for you. Um, I, I wanted this book to be like, sort of like an encyclopedia of options. Cause I felt like when I was grieving my pets, I was so overwhelmed and not sure what I wanted to do that. I think having a, a book where I could look at all these different, um, things and, and think about what's right. Um, though I encourage people to think about these things long before your pet dies. So then you're not trying to make decisions like while you're in the vet, you know, at the stainless steel table. Um, so those are all different things. I'm happy to chat more after if you want to know more specifics about taxidermy or cloning or mummification. But um, I think in some ways it's very freeing that there's no one socially acceptable way to mourn pets. Cause you can really, you can really do some pretty cool and unusual things. I think. I, I think it's neat too, to think that, wow, okay. Someone would taxidermy their pet. Like you might think, well, I'd never do that, but at least I'm not alone in that, that depth of grief mm -hmm. that, you know, somebody must've felt a similar depth of grief to, to be thinking about doing that or doing that. Um, oh, one other thing, um, and I wrote an article about this for Bark Magazine, was that um, when my dog Remy died, my son was nine, and actually this is this is Remy's obituary in his collar, um, and it was my son's first experience with grief. And one of the things we did was have a celebration of life for him, mm -hmm. and we had it at the clinic, and we had an ice cream sundae bar. And that was sort of a really positive, you know, you hear about that for people, but I was like, Remy loved to eat. We'll have ice cream. And our remaining dog was there and she had a frosty paws. <laughs> so, you know, I passed out some frosty paws for the other dogs at the clinic. Um, but yeah, EB's book is great. And there's, um, I love when you talk about in Japan, what they do. And then also, um, I love the story about the retired New York city police officer cloned his dog and it just like you you think Barbara Streisand cloned her dog <laughs> right because she she did but yeah. you don't think about a retired New York City police officer and I, I love that story yeah and and that story was interesting because I think I tried really hard to reserve judgment when I went into interviews but like a little part of me was like why are you cloning a dog there's so many dogs in shelters you know I had that kind of thing in the back of my head but as I spoke to him you know, and he was explaining his reasoning and how he felt like having her DNA alive again, even though like he very logically knows these dogs are not like just duplicates of his dog that died. You know, it, I was like, you know what? I don't think I would do it necessarily, but it works for him. It makes him really happy. He has these two beautiful dogs that he loves so much. And, you know, I, I think whatever works for you, um, is, you know, works. And also something else, um, to keep in mind is what works for one animal isn't necessarily what works for another one. I think when I was younger, I felt like, oh, well, if we did this for Gus, you know, my first dog, we have to do this for Gwen and we'll have to do this for Seymour. But like Gus was a very adventure, you know, seeking dog. He always was running away. So we had him cremated and we, we scattered his ashes near this lighthouse where he would go fishing with my dad and he would like bark at seagulls and like eat things and puke. And he like loved it. And then my dog Gwen was like such a homebody that we just brought her home from the vet and buried her like right in the yard. And I was like, that's what Gwen would want would be like to be up close to the house, nice and safe. So like, 
I think that's important to remind people as well that, you know, and also depending on where you are in your life or like if you're making the decision just for yourself or you have to talk to, you know, your kids or your partner about what they also want, like it's, you know, it, everything varies and changes, but and I think finally, you know, something that helps when you're, you know, thinking about all these intense topics is to have a sense of humor. Um, and there's definitely, I think, a sense of humor in both of our books. And I, I like the story too about what you wanted to call your book, but you're. Oh. <laughs> yeah. So when I was writing this book for a long time, my working title was just Dead Pets. Um, that's like still what my Word document is called. And I sold the book to my publisher and they said we. We love it. We think people will really respond to it. We can't call it dead pets. And I said, but why? It's like, it's dark. It's kind of funny. It's to the point. They're like, no, we want this to be a book <laughs> that you could give to somebody whose animal just died. And that's a little too like crass. And I said, I wouldn't mind getting a book like that. And they were like, EB, you have a dark <laughs> sense of humor. Um, so we brainstormed and I came up with good grief, which I really love because, you know, it's a nod to Charlie Brown and Snoopy, very famous human pet duo. Um, and I like the idea that we keep having pets, you know, it must be a good type of grieving to be willing to go through it over and over. And then I like the sort of exasperated nature as well. Cause like good grief, like why do we keep doing this to ourselves, you know, um, falling in love with animals just to have them die, but obviously it's worth it. So. A couple other questions. We're, we're not yeah. going to get to all the online questions, unfortunately, but one is about um, somebody whose young pet was killed and the other pet in the house or siblings of that pet are grieving. Any advice about, um, you know, the grieving uh, pets that are, are surviving, how to help them or? Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I mean, a couple things I've heard is, I mean, if a animal is killed suddenly, and one thing I will add, I think another reason why pet death can be traumatic is I feel like pets die in some very violent and sudden ways sometimes too. Um, but I've heard that if you can, you know, euthanize a pet and have the living pets like view the body like a wake kind of um, or a funeral, then animals understand death in their own way. So they can like sniff and you know, get, okay, my friend is gone. Um, I've also found too, that like keeping items around the house, like if there was a bed that your cat shared together, don't throw out the bed because it reminds you of the cat that's, you know, no longer alive because the living cat might still want to be in that space. Um, those are just a few things that I've heard. Yeah. I think especially the, the sense of smell that it mm -hmm. smells like the other animal. And I, I think for an animal that's sick, um, a lot of times the other animals in the home know that they can smell that they know that that animal is sick or dying and it's not a surprise for them, but a sudden death. Um, yeah, it's traumatic for, for everybody. Um, and try to kind of see what that animal needs. If it's a dog that now can't play with its friend, maybe you can take it to a dog park or doggy daycare or something like that. Um, with my dog Velvet, when Remy died, we just knew she needed another friend. And I, I said, you know, I can't bring him back, but I can get you another pack member. And, uh, you know, they they do grieve, you know, they definitely do, even if the loss was not surprising for them, like Remy and Velvet were kind of soulmates, you know, they did, they, we used to say they didn't know they were two dogs, they thought they were one dog. <laughs> Um, so that's, that's hard too, to watch your animal go through that, but you can kind of grieve together and, and say, you know, okay, I understand it's, it's hard. I miss them too. Mm -hmm. There was another great question about either an individual or a community that has limited resources to be able to provide. How do, how can you provide support, counseling, uh, grief support for, for those folks? There's a lot of stuff online. Mm -hmm. um, and there's even, um, yeah, there's some groups and that like the pet loss hotline would be a way. Um, I think there's some free support groups. Um, so I think that there, I think there's a lot of options. Yeah. Oh, lap of love. Are you saying support group? Yeah. Yeah, in fact, when I, I was, um, I have a resource section in the back of my book, and um, we were, I was updating everything, and there's a lot of pet loss hotlines um, that I had on my website that are, that are now defunct, so Tufts is still very good, and there's a few others, but not that many, more than half, I think, were 
Well, that's a good segue because we're just about out of time. <laughs> and there was a question about, do the students get training um, who are staffing our PELOS hotline? And the answer is yes, we do, we do training. We do debriefings on a regular basis for difficult cases or things that they struggle with. But we're also very clear that um, our students are not therapists. They're not trained grief counselors. Um, they're not providing therapy. They're clear on that. Uh, they make it clear to whoever calls, yet they still have the ability to provide empathy and uh, strong listening skills and really support people who are grieving, uh, even though they're not able to give you know, professional advice. Um, we are always looking for students in our school to become volunteers in that program. So there's some information down here if you're interested, if you're a student at Tufts and would like to volunteer. Um, I think it's wonderful both for a service for the community, but also for yourselves. Uh, you get incredible practice um, working with folks who are really struggling with loss and grief. And I think that is in addition to the science and medicine behind um, veterinary medicine, I think that's an important, important skill uh, to practice and to become good at. And I think ultimately it makes you a better doctor um, when you really understand and have time to talk to people before you become that doctor and are in that position of making more decisions and working directly with clients. So I would encourage you to consider that. Um, lastly, um, uh, EB's book is here for purchase if you're interested, and I believe she'll sign it as well. We also have some information up front um, about pet loss. Uh, from a few organizations and some information about our pet loss hotline. Um, yeah, so and, the, the yes. it's like this, but it's going to be hardcover. This is my advanced reader copy. That's coming out in March. It's coming out in March, March 14th. Um, and what other is, events do you have coming up, Karen? <laughs> we are in conversation um, at Porter Square Books the day after the book comes out. So that's Wednesday, March 15th. And then I'm having a party. Oh, I should have printed that flyer and brought it, but I'm having a sort of launch book party free cake and snacks at Tatnik Bookseller on Sunday, March 19th. And you're also speaking at Westboro Public Library? At Westboro Public oh, right. Library, that's March March 1st. 1st March yeah. 1st. Um, yeah, and then I'm going to be at the Newburyport Literary Festival, which I'm excited about. Well, thank you both very much. As Dr. Kara said, this is like a, it was a nice fireside chat, <laughs> and uh, hopefully everybody enjoyed it and found some help from it. Um, again, let's uh, round of applause for our speakers. Everybody have a good night. <laughs>